Hello, and welcome to Fraud Eat Strategy, an FTI consulting podcast series in which we explore the myriad ways that fraud, corruption, and misconduct can derail strategy and cause havoc. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director at FTI's Forensic and Litigation Consulting Practice, where I assist clients and their outside counsel in managing their response to event-driven white-collar crime, misconduct, and bribery incidents. Thank you for listening. In this episode, we're going to talk remote witness interviews and how to make the best of a bad situation using time-tested interrogation techniques and other methods. While things are starting to return to something resembling normal, our use of video conferencing as a business tool is here to stay. Uh, I've been fielding a lot of questions about the use of body language and other techniques to try to limit a witness or deponent's ability to be coached or misdirect the interviewer. Uh, with us today is a subject matter expert on interviewing and interrogation skills, uh, Michael Brett Hood. Brett is the founding partner of 21st Century Learning and Consulting LLC, where he teaches leadership skills. He's also an adjunct professor of corporate governance and ethics at University of Virginia. Welcome, Brett. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So, Brett, with so many of us having to work from home, investigators and attorneys, two professions that are best practiced in person, uh, have had to make much more extensive use of video conferencing. And this seems to have invigorated debates about the use of body language and other physical cues to detect deception, or if someone is being coached off screen. How reliable is the use of body language to determine if someone is being deceptive? You know, it's really interesting that you ask that, because as people look at interviewing, they think that there's going to be certain behaviors or, or certain um, little clues or ticks that will tip people off that the person that, that they're interviewing is lying. If you look at the research of Saul Kassin, a, a John Jay criminal uh, college professor, look at the research of UAB professor Tim Levine, they've all come to the same conclusion, is that there is no single reliable indicator of deception. Now, Levine went a little bit further, and, and this is discussed in um, Malcolm Gladwell's new book, Talking With Strangers. What Levine found is that we, are, especially FBI people, trained law enforcement, stuff like that, we are very good at detecting deception with nonverbal behavior in the obvious liars. So the people who put off the same behaviors that we expect of liars, we're good at catching that. But what we're really not good at is catching the honest liars. And what that means is the person who comes in, gives you a firm handshake, looks you right in the eyes, does all these things that we expect truthful people to do. We're about at 20% at catching those. We're also not very good at the nervous truth tellers, the ones who start to exhibit behavior that we see as being nervous. We inaccurately categorize them as people who are, are being deceptive, when in reality they're telling the truth. But if you were rely on nonverbal behaviors as a means of detecting deception in an interview, then you're going to be right about 52 to 53% of the time. We're not very good at detecting deception because no matter what you do, there is no one single indicator of a nonverbal body movement or a tell that indicates deception throughout races, throughout cultures, throughout sex, all that different stuff. You know, so under normal circumstances, interviewers may want to stage the interview room in a certain way, which is not possible when interviewing remotely. Is there any advantage to staging the room that the interviewer is in? No, it's interesting because they have actually done some studies on this. They mostly studied about ethicality, but they also studied in the fraud. Um, I think it was Dr. Mariam Kuchaki from Northwestern University and Dr. Sreed Haradis Desai from the University of North Carolina. What they did in the office space, and I think this would apply to remote interviews, is that they put up symbols of morality, pictures of leaders who represented morality. So you put up pictures of Gandhi, you put up pictures of Nelson Mandela, you know, people that are symbolic as with morality and ethics. And as they put these pictures around the workplace, they found in their study that behavior, especially ethical behavior, started to increase. Incidents of unethical behavior started to decrease. And what it does is if you combine that with the studies of um, Dr. Dan Airely from Duke University, who basically has proven that we all are comfortable lying just a little bit. What you do is if you can put up something in your background or, or even just a picture 
of something that just invokes morality, when people are reminded of morality, they're more likely to be truthful. If you put up a picture of a Gandhi or put up a picture of Mandela, put up um, even a saying, uh, they did this test on an email where, you know how some people have that little stock message at the bottom of the email that goes out with every email. Their message was, it is better to fail with honesty than to succeed by fraud, something to that nature. And when that message was inserted in the email and just a little innocuous thing at the bottom, people became more ethical. So if you're doing a remote interview, you can control the space that you have. And if you can find some way to inject morality in that moment through a picture, through a phrase that is prominently displayed, you're going to remind people of morality and that will affect them in a way that they don't always consciously realize. And the studies have shown that it will make them more ethical and more honest than what they normally would. Brett, in some of your writing, you talk about the importance of silence. Can you elaborate on how the use of silence will enable you to get more out of an interview? Yeah, so think about when you do an interview with somebody, and let's say you're doing an interview with a suspect where you're looking for that admission, and you ask a question, and the suspect starts to give you their story, and then they complete their narrative of their story. Now, imagine that you sit there for just a few seconds and you just look at them, and you just remain quiet. What do you think is going on inside their head? Are they asking themselves, does this guy believe this story? Um, is this interviewer going to buy what I'm selling? And so they get nervous. Now, I will tell you that a lot of interviewers are uncomfortable with silence because, face it, when you're in a conversation with somebody, you get that silence that lasts for more than one or two seconds. It is uncomfortable. But also remember that as the interviewer, the person you are interviewing is probably much more uncomfortable than you with the silence. And so what generally happens is if you remain silent, and maybe if you just tap your pen on the, on the table or you just say, mm, okay, and you just remain silent, chances are that your interviewee is going to start throwing out more information because they're uncomfortable with that silence. And usually this extraneous information, if you're listening carefully, might contradict something that was done earlier. And so in that way, I like to use silence and pauses as a way to see if I can generate more information from the interviewee. It makes a huge difference. And you just, as an interviewer, you can't be thinking about the next question as much as you want to see what happens. How do they react to that uncomfortable silence? Yeah, there's, um, there's actually quite a few. Uh, if you did, like say we did a Zoom where you've got a camera, um, you still get to see that personal look. So you can see the different facial reactions and stuff like that. Because sometimes when people deliver a message, it's important to see the context. Because I mean, imagine that you receive an email and you can't really tell the context. So you take it completely differently than what the sender intended. So you still get that. And people, and I, we'll talk about rapport, I know. But even though you're doing a Zoom conference, you can still establish rapport with the video monitor, as well as without it. And we'll, we'll talk about different ways to do that. But it can also remove some of the biases that you have. Um, when you get in a room, you go into a building, let's say the office is ornate, or you, you have something that happens that makes you mad as you go in. Um, all these things interfere, excuse me, interfere with your conscious and your unconscious. So when you go into a building, you might like the building, you go into a building, you might not like it. Believe it or not, that has an effect on how you interview that person. So when you remove that, then you can take some of the biases away. And some of those preconceived notions about what's going to happen kind of disappear when you have Zoom instead of walking into an office. Now, you also have some negatives of that. Usually if they're sitting at a desk, you can look around the desk and find uh, little little things that tell you a little bit about the person, such as pictures, diplomas, you may not see that, but it's still possible to achieve that rapport and that building trust, even though you're not in the same room with the person. No, that's, um, that's really interesting. You know, it, it, we were, um, had a phone call with a law firm, uh, uh, those remote depositions. And, and one of the attorneys had a really interesting uh, observation in terms of the positives. He said, you know, in a courtroom, um, you know, so I guess this was a hearing. It wasn't a, a, a uh, wasn't a deposition because there was a, there, there was a, a, a judge participating. He says in a courtroom that 
you're pretty far away from the judge and there's a lot else going on. So you really uh, can't spend much time watching the judge. Uh, whereas on a Zoom call, if there's only a handful of participants, you know, literally zoomed in. Right. As a young investigator, I was hyper vigilant on the alert for body language. I'm, I'm less so now, but still find myself scrutinizing the interviewee. How important is it to have someone else take notes so that the interviewer can also act as observer? If you have two different people to do that, then it helps. And especially if you have one person who's responsible for taking notes, the person taking notes is going to be focused on, you know, trying to capture, you know, the intent of what is being said. But if I can focus without having to worry about taking notes, I can focus more closely on what is actually being said. And what I mean by that is we have a tendency to interpret what is being said. For example, we ask a person, did you steal the money? Their response, I would never steal money from this bank or this organization. If you parse that apart, they didn't say no, because never doesn't mean no. And if you ask an innocent person, did you steal the money? The answer normally would be no. Now, an indicator like that doesn't mean that the person actually stole the money. It means that they may have some discomfort talking about the subject. So if I've got somebody taking notes, then I can listen more carefully to exactly what is being said and then make a mental notation like, all right, they, were, they seem to be a little bit uncomfortable talking about this area and then come back to it. Whereas if I'm also asking questions and taking notes, then I'm going to be focused on trying to get down what they just said. And I'm going to miss a couple of those verbal cues that could end up being very important in the end interview. I agree with you because, you know, the, I just, I think also the, the note taking process, you know, causes you to break eye contact, disrupts the flow of the interview. You know, maybe you're at a really important juncture where this person is being very forthcoming or at least sharing a lot of information and have to stop for, you know, to transcribe, you know, potentially you're going to lose some of that momentum. So, you know, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. If you, um, if you practice, one of the things in active listening is mirroring and reflecting. And so if I'm writing notes, the person that I'm interviewing is not writing notes. That breaks that bond that we have. If I'm mirroring his or her behaviors as we're talking, that creates that connection. And if you get that connection, that rapport, then you increase the chances that someone might tell you a couple of things that they don't want to talk about. You know, the, the resolution of surveillance cameras and just keeps getting better and better. You know, biometric technology seems to be everywhere. You know, artificial intelligence is advancing really rapidly. You know, has any of this tech that you're aware of been put to use for the purpose of lie detection? Yeah, there's been a few things. They've actually done some stuff with AI to analyze statements. That has shown some promise, but it, it still, that they've done um, an fMRI test where they monitor your brain while you answer questions to see which areas the brain light up. But so far, everything that I've read shows that there's a, at least a significant amount of false positives or, or inconsistencies that make it not completely reliable. In Japan, for example, they've even established a program based on AI and cameras that they claim they can accurately predict whether someone's going to shoplift in a store to the 85th percentile. Now, I think that's, that's pretty good. But what if you're in the 15th percent who gets stopped and there was no intention of shoplifting? Same thing happens here with, with AI studying statements and, and fMRIs and voice analyzers and things like that. The highest I've seen is like 75% possibly accurately detecting deception. But again, what if you're in that 25%? Yeah, that's, that's, that's why polygraphs aren't, aren't, aren't admissible. Yes. Because uh, they're, you know, accurate, I think, 72% of the time, or you know, it, leaves a, it leaves a lot to chance. Exactly. But, you know, the thing about polygraph that I always really struck me is, terrifying is that a, if you're, you know, happen to be a sociopath, then you can easily beat it. Well, yeah, <laughs> and I've even read that like if, if some people put a thumbtack in their shoe, it can help them defeat a polygraph, which is just crazy. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack with that one too, right? I'm like, you know, that if you're going to the extremes of, you know, 
impaling yourself to uh, <laughs> to try to to beat a polygraph. You know, <laughs> what other lengths will you go to? <laughs> but as you know, people will do crazy and stupid things. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to be in a room with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, contrary to how, and, you know, I think, you know, as you know, you and I are both, I guess we didn't talk about this. We're both former FBI agents uh, or it can be cringe inducing sometimes watching how uh, law enforcement uh, processes are portrayed uh, on television and, uh, and in movies. And most notably, you know, how the, the, uh, the, the FBI is like the evil empire at times, uh, at least in terms of how they're portrayed. You know, the interview setting is often portrayed as something adversarial, um, you know, good cop, bad cop, you know, where there's a lot of shouting and the interviewer is being very demonstrative. But in actuality, you know, some of the most effective, you know, proven uh, techniques in, you know, interviewing is, is investing a little time building a rapport with the subject, even if the person on the other side of the table is you know, as reprehensible a human being as you would ever find yourself sitting across from, it is still a really good practice, you know, to, to try to find common ground, to try to, you know, build some trust and, and build a rapport. Um, what are some good techniques to build rapport? And is building rapport different when using video conferencing? You know, building rapport, it's, it's, it's different when you're in person because you can do a couple other things. Like you can lean in to kind of create that closeness, that bond. But still, even if you have a Zoom audio, you're doing remote with Zoom or you're doing remote with just strictly a phone call, the principles of active listening will still apply. Because as people, you know, we, we talk about mirroring and reflecting, we talked about earlier, and that's just mimicking the behavior of the person that you're interviewing. Well, in a Zoom call, I can easily see what they're doing and I can kind of mimic and reflect what I'm seeing. But if we're doing a remote phone call and, and let's say we have a delay or we just don't have video, you can still accomplish the mirroring and reflecting by using and choosing the words that your interviewee uses. Because what happens in our brain is 95% of the decisions we make are all on an unconscious level. So when a person is telling a story and I follow the principles of active listening, such as minimal encouragers, as they're telling a story, you say, yes, okay, good. And, um, asking the, the mirroring, picturing the word says, well, I didn't really steal the money. So you didn't really steal the money. I'm regurgitating the words they say. And then every so often I paraphrase what they say and I summarize. And then I even say like, it sounds like you are angry. And all of these things work on that subconscious level. And it gets people when they hear the words regurgitated, when they see the movements mirror, what it says to them and what it does to their body is that it says that person who is talking to me, sitting across from me, who I see on the screen is just like me. And so that helps build that rapport without them even knowing it. So even though you're not in the same room, practicing all eight skills of active listening, minimal encouragers, open-ended questions, reflecting mirroring, emotional labeling, paraphrasing, eye messages, effective pauses, and summarizing what they say, Using these principles can help you establish rapport, which will then in turn get your interviewee to provide more information to you. Those are some great points, Brad. You know, we've talked a little bit about body language and, and, um, and other interviewing techniques. Um, well, body language and, and uh, cultural norms, they vary pretty widely from one country to the next. Uh, so what are some examples of body language or other cultural pitfalls that we should consider when investigating across different cultures. In America, the number one indicator for people in detecting deception is gaze aversion. So people think that if they don't look you in the eye, that they're, going, they're lying to you. Well, if you go to Asia, in certain cultures, in certain sections of Asia, it is not appropriate for someone to look you in the eye. Go to the Middle East, it's the same thing. In other cases, I've been, uh, I've been lucky enough to be to, been to 69 countries. And so I've made my share of faux pas. And uh, some of them you just don't even realize. It can be verbal, it can be a uh, physical action. In some cultures, you show the bottom of your foot to someone. That is incredibly insulting. I remember being in Bangladesh, and uh, luckily I had studied this before I went, but we were, we were teaching a class and it could have easily happened during an interview as well. We, we get a break and we go to lunch 
And as we're walking to a lunch, one of the students grabs my hand and holds it. Now, luckily, I had read about that beforehand. That is a sign of respect in Bangladesh. But if I hadn't known that growing up in America, there would be a totally different connotation of a guy grabbing my hand. And so if you're going to do interviews with other culture, then you should make endeavors to understand what about that culture, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. One of my favorite stories ever was we had a, a friend from um, the United Kingdom and he gets promoted, he comes over to the United States to run, I think it was a Marriott branch or regional or something like that. And so he has an office and he had this, this little old lady who was his top administrative person. And so he was just getting in the office and he made a list of things that he wanted. And he was telling this as administrative person, like, these are the things I need. He says, no, I need uh, number two pencils. I need a stapler. And then he says to her, I need a rubber. And the look on her face, was in <laughs> rubber has a different meaning than it does in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom rubber means an eraser. And that's what he wanted. We take that into our interviews some of the words we take for granted are completely different when applied overseas. So anytime I'm interviewing somebody from another culture, another country, I go to the Department of State website, um, I Google different cultures, you know, that country's culture, and I try to learn as much as I can because if you make one small mistake in a remote interview, then you have most likely lost the ability to connect to that person. And then as we talked about, you know, TV portraying interviews as adversarial, man, you, you make them mad over some cultural thing, it's adversarial from that point on, and it's hard to recover from. Oh, that's a really good point. So um, we talked about this a little earlier before we started the episode. Um, you know, we've been hearing from some clients who um, you know, have expressed concern um, if they're using remote video conferencing technology to do depositions uh, about the possibility that the deponent, um, you know, might be receiving coaching in some way, either from a, you know, an, an earpiece, a smartphone, uh, or someone that's just off camera. What advice do you have as to how to detect that situation and steps that could be taken to, to guard against it? Well, that's a real issue because, I mean, uh, as you look at a Zoom call, you can only see what the camera shows. And it's easy to have somebody off screen, have an earpiece, have a phone, something, somebody in there monitoring. If I'm asking questions and I'm concerned about the answers, I will ask them a straight up question. Is there anybody there with you? They should say no. And if they come back with, say, uh, a question, why are you asking me that question? Why do you think somebody's in the room? That makes me a little bit concerned. I'd ask him, is anybody coaching you during this deposition? Same thing, because you should get yes or no answers. If I can see them, what I'm looking for is any indication that they're looking off screen, but the most effective way to, to handle something like this is, bottom line, whether you're doing a deposition, an interview, you're trying to get the truth. And so what I would do is ask a question, an important question in the first 10 minutes of the interview. And then at the 40 minute mark, 45, whatever, whatever minutes you deem necessary, but after a certain amount of time has passed, I'd ask the same question in a similar but not the same manner. So I'd slightly alter the question, but basically ask the same thing. Because people forget what they say, and then if I'm being coached, I mean, the story should never change. If it's true, the story should never change. But if I'm being coached on what to say, then a person that is assisting someone might not be able to regurgitate the same story. The other technique that I can use is something that is part of the cognitive interview technique, and they call this the reverse order method. So when we normally do interviews, we start from beginning to end, say, okay, tell me what happened and go. And then our natural progression is, okay, on Monday, this happened on Tuesday, on Wednesday, blah, blah, blah. In the reverse order technique, it says, starting on Friday at noon, Tell me what happened going backwards for the rest of the week. And so the idea behind that is when you tell a story in chronological order, it's easy to build upon lie after lie. But when you're telling a story in reverse order, now you have to shrink the lies instead of building on them. And it makes it much more difficult for liars to construct that story as opposed to truth tellers who know exactly what happened. If someone's coaching them, then it, they're not going to expect that line of questioning. 
And therefore, it's going to be harder because they haven't rehearsed that answer going backwards. Wow, that's a, that's a great insight. Uh, I, I like that. I uh, think I'm going gonna, gonna to put that one in my, in my toolbox. Good. Uh, so um, as, as, as you well know, uh, some people don't want to be interviewed. And, and sometimes there's a, a, almost a, a fugitive investigation that precedes an, an interview of a reluctant witness or perhaps a, uh, someone who's got the potential to make that jump to person of interest. When showing up at their doorstep could worsen a public health crisis, uh, what are some strategies you'd recommend to get the reluctant interviewee to consent? You know, this, if we go back to active listening, there, there's some really good tricks you can use, especially with emotional labeling. So you reach out to this person, they're hesitant to do uh, uh, an interview with you. If we use emotional labeling, you can say something like, well, you sound concerned. Can you tell me why you're concerned? And so what that does is it starts building the bond and you start that conversation. Uh, and then if you start paraphrasing, you start summarizing and have these encouragers, you address some of these concerns. It's okay, so you said you're concerned about this. You seem frustrated by this. What can I do to make you more at ease? That's the I message. You're, you're taking responsibility, you're taking ownership. And what you're doing is subconsciously, you're creating that bond and that rapport. And if you can get that person to at least like you a little bit, that makes them more likely to agree to being interviewed as opposed to just going up to them and saying, look, I know you did this. I want to interview you. He says, well, I don't think I want to do that. He says, well, you have to see how the, the two differences. is. One, you seem understanding, or at least you seem in, interested in learning about how I feel. And if you make it more about them and you get that conversation rolling, then hopefully you're going to break down some of those barriers. And then you can turn that, you know, what are your concerns into what happened? Well, this whole conversation is getting me all fired up to go do some uh, admission seeking interviews. So I, I, I just have to go find someone to, uh, to admit to something. It's always great to, to, to speak to somebody who does, you know, something very similar to, to what I do. And, and especially when we have that common background as former FBI special agents. So that's all the time we have today. You know, these have been some great insights and I really appreciate you joining us today, Brad. So that was former FBI Special Agent uh, Michael Brett Hood, uh, who is the founder of 21st Century Learning and Consulting. This concludes this episode of Fraud Eat Strategy. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director in FTI Consulting's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment. Thank you for listening, and stay tuned for the next episode of Fraud Eat Strategy, when we'll hear from noted Chief Compliance Officer and Thought Leader, Carrie Penman from NAVEX Global, together with George Washington University Business School Assistant Professor Kyle Welch, who will help answer the question, is it possible to measure the return on investment of effective compliance? If you have an idea on a fraud or corruption case, topic, or guest that you'd like to hear about on a future episode, email us at fraudeatstrategy at fticonsulting.com. 